The moon landings never happened. 9-11 was an inside job. The Earth is flat, Elvis lives, and Covid was a hoax. Whether or not you believe in any of these or other conspiracy theories is frankly irrelevant to the question I am about to ask. How do you know for sure? That the moon landings did or did not happen, that 9-11 was, as the mainstream media tells us, an act of terror perpetrated by Osama bin Laden, or, on the other side of the coin, that it was an act of terror perpetrated by the US government against its own people. Did it even happen? How do you know for sure? How do you know for sure that the Earth is round? This Earth, the one on your screen right now, is it spherical? At first glance, the evidence suggests it is. As it spins, we see the other areas of the supposed sphere reveal themselves. It would seem as though it is safe to assume that this is a sphere, and, as the saying goes, seeing is believing. Right? Of course, we know that this Earth, the one on your screen right now, is in fact a two-dimensional image, whereas a sphere is a three-dimensional object. It's arguable whether it even counts as an image, as it is really just a combination of LED lights changing colours as required by each pixel. This Earth is absolutely not a sphere. It is an illusion. The other side of the Earth on your screen right now does not exist as you watch this image. There is nothing but the lights you are seeing at any given moment. I think Elvis would be dead by now regardless, but if he was still around, would he have survived Covid? And was it all a hoax, a ploy to enslave us all or have microchips injected into our bloodstreams? I think it's unlikely, but why do I think that? Am I justified in thinking that? Is this a fact? What is a fact? What does it mean to find the truth? What is truth? Is it possible to know anything with 100% certainty? These questions and other theoretical ponderings belong to a branch of philosophy known as epistemology, and, believe it or not, excuse the pun, there are numerous theories which suggest different approaches to how we can know things. I'll take us through a few of the most well-known epistemological theories before clarifying my own stance on this matter. First, since we are discussing how we can know, it's important to define what we mean by the word know-ledge, or knowledge, if you prefer. Knowledge could be defined as understanding and awareness acquired through experience, learning or reasoning, which enables individuals to comprehend, interpret and apply information in various contexts. This definition encompasses the acquisition of factual, procedural and conceptual understanding, reflecting the multifaceted nature of knowledge. Knowledge as justifiable true belief. In 1963, the philosopher Edmund Gettier proposed that knowledge must have those three elements to be rightfully considered knowledge. That is, it must be true, the bearer must believe it is true, and this belief must also be justified. Now, there are holes to be picked in this, not least Gettier's use of the word truth, which requires rigorous inspection, and one could also argue the words justified and belief ought to be scrutinised in this context too. This is partly a problem of words, they can be rather inaccurate at times. Then there are logical axioms, that are, in themselves, true without requiring any further justification. For example, all bachelors are unmarried. I personally have a problem with this sort of logic though, in that it is circular in its justification of itself. All bachelors are unmarried because in the category of unmarried people belongs the bachelors subcategory, and round and round the logic goes. Logical axioms, as far as I can tell, also rely upon the understanding of a system or language that is human in construction. For example, Mathematical axioms, which are often stated as forms of fact, for example, 1 plus 1 equals 2, relies on the understanding of a system we call mathematics, that was produced to justify itself. Does a deer think of this equation when it spots two hunters in the bushes? Does a deer count? Are numbers, and by that I mean the essence of what the numerical symbols represent, discovered or invented? I'm not sure, but it doesn't sit well with me to describe this type of axiom as a truth. Who gets to determine that something is true? God created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. Jesus walked on water, he also made wine from the stuff. 
Father Christmas has a naughty and nice list. The Tooth Fairy gives you money for your teeth. And the universe was created in a Big Bang. Did you see what I did there? All of these presuppositions are beliefs that people have inherited from authority figures. Whether that be religious figures, parents, or even scientists. None of us actually know whether the universe was created in a Big Bang, no more than we know if there is or is not a divine creator. One thing I would say is that there are a series of fundamental questions about the very nature of reality that I believe will never be fully answered. One such question concerns the Big Bang. If there was nothing before it, how could the universe have sprung from nothing? As Rupert Sheldrake articulates in his talk about the fundamental flaws of the scientific dogma. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, uh, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. If the universe is infinite, what does that really mean? If the universe is not infinite, what is outside of it? How did life emerge from inanimate material? Did time have a beginning? Will it have an end? Is it all an illusion? There is also the problem of the very small scale. Whatever the smallest particle known to scientists at any particular moment in time may be, one can always ask what is that made of? And then whatever conclusion we come to from that question, we can ask again what is that made of? Ad infinitum until we get to an answer that seems totally unsatisfactory to our view of the universe, that is, that it is made up of physical stuff. How can it be? I suppose this is why many people believe in a creator of one sort or another, partly because there is no satisfactory answer to these types of questions. Of course, creationists ultimately have the same problem. Who made the creator? These questions and problems, although seemingly trivial and maybe somewhat juvenile, are to me not immaterial in that they have to do with the very foundations of all of our knowledge. If we do not know how this all began, what there is outside of it, whether it will all end and what it's all made of, what hope do we really have of explaining the reality of our universe and of our own existence? The blissful acceptance of these glaring omissions from our knowledge base and the arrogance of knowing that has emerged from this can be traced back to the leading epistemological stance of our times, known as scientific realism. Scientific realism is the belief that real knowledge comes from scientific experimentation alone, and that scientific theories and models also count as real knowledge, like for example the theory of evolution, which is both a theory and a model to describe how complex organisms came to be from the earliest single-celled ones. Note that the theory of evolution cannot explain how the first single-celled organism came to be in the first place. There's that inconvenient knowledge gap again. But scientists today would have a hard time arguing that the theory of evolution did not completely transform our understanding of life on this planet. Logical positivism, which goes hand in hand with scientific realism, is the belief that the knowledge created through true scientific method is the only verifiable truth. The only way around these inconvenient omissions, as far as I can tell, is to assume that every statement of truth or declaration of fact comes with some silent or unspoken caveat or fine print that goes something along the lines of, given our current scientific understanding of the nature of the universe, we believe... Dot, dot, dot. Insert statement of fact here. For example, that the universe began with the Big Bang, and sort of ring fence a particular knowledge type before giving a statement of fact. We do sometimes hear this stated, to be fair, but perhaps this is, in part, the duty also of the researcher to take into account the epistemological stance of whichever bearer of facts he or she is consuming at that moment, and accept or reject appropriately given the wider contextual information in tandem with his or her own epistemological preferences, in the same way that you wouldn't trust the words of a friend whose epistemological stance involved lying or bragging a lot. Honestly, mate, just trust me. Science and the scientific method have enabled humans to make great advancements in our understanding of the world, having destabilised many of the religious epistemologies that were the leading dogma for centuries before. Postmodernism, an umbrella term used to describe many of the cultural phenomena that make up the zeitgeist of our times, is also the epistemological viewpoint that encourages distrust in grand narratives and the authority figures that push them. 
The rise of the postmodern era also brought about an inherent scepticism, a distrust not only in grand narratives but in large corporations and often fellow human beings. It is partly the sense that there is an ongoing battle between the powerful and the powerless, and that if not careful a dystopian future of enslaved citizens awaits. The recent emergence and development of so-called AI does little to impede the flames in that respect. I'll come back to scepticism, but first I want to mention empiricism, which is the view that knowledge comes from sensory experiences, as well as rationalism, which states it comes primarily through reason and intellect. These align vaguely with the idea of a priori and a posteriori knowledge, which is that which can be known independently of experience versus that which can only be known through experience. For example, knowing how the inside of your own mouth feels. Which, by the way, would be very difficult to describe in words, but we do know that we know how the inside of our mouth feels because we would know if something changed, like if a tooth fell out or got chipped, or if we had an ulcer, for example. Both empiricism and rationalism sit neatly under the banner of constructivism, which says that knowledge is constructed as opposed to it being inherently present in the universe, waiting to be discovered. Constructivism is often referred to as social constructivism, since this construction of knowledge is seen as a social phenomenon arising via the process of humans interacting with one another. When it comes to my own beliefs, I have to say I am sceptical that we can know anything with absolute certainty. I believe that saying we do know things with complete certainty is most likely a flaw of the human psyche and its ego, most notably falling for errors associated with confirmation bias, overconfidence, ignorance and arrogance. It's also a case of survivorship bias, since anyone who lived their day-to-day -day life as though they actually knew nothing at all about reality would likely end up outcast from society or admitted to a psychiatric hospital, and so those who survive this process to tell their truth are those whose perspectives sit within the bounds of what we might call normal, and who conform to the general expectations of the society to which they belong. Still, I am very suspicious of anyone who spouts absolute truths, yet unfortunately we seem to belong to a world that gives more airtime to those both at the extremes of a debate and who state their position with great confidence. More often than not, there is a whole bunch of nuance to any debate, and so the people claiming there isn't are either egotistical, ignorant or have ulterior motives. My research project, which I'll come on to later, ties into this problem of the ignorant and their confidence in their beliefs. I would certainly not call myself a conspiracy theorist, but the motives of conspiracy theorists do come from a virtuous place, that is, not to accept at face value what you're told by authority figures. The problem conspiracy theorists fall down on is that they overcommit to their alternate theory, thus becoming the very thing they oppose. For the record, I do not believe the Earth is flat, but I also don't believe that I know with 100% certainty that it's round either. I'm close enough to certain that I can get on with my day-to-day -day life without thinking about it. Call it 99% certain. But what if Earth is actually like this Earth on the screen? What if the bits of the universe you aren't looking at don't exist until you look at them? I don't necessarily align with this idea, known as simulation theory, a modern theory originating from computer science which in true full circle fashion necessitates a creator, but I do think everyone should approach knowledge and truth with a bit more humility, especially as recent theories about dark matter and quantum entanglement threaten to expose our current understanding of the laws of physics as a complete sham. Will future generations look back at us and scoff at how little we really knew? probably, but they must also realise that they too will be scoffed at by their descendants, and with any luck, so on and so forth. No belief is truly justified because we don't know the underlying nature of our reality. As we discover more about this, our entire perspective shifts, just as it did with the discovery of electricity, or the theory of evolution, or that the earth is in motion, or that it is not necessarily the centre of everything. These discoveries, as well as countless less prominent ones, all contribute to our shifting cultural understanding over time. Unfortunately for us, I doubt that we will ever have answers for the most fundamental questions, and so whilst we may get close to having a true depiction of the universe and everything in it, we may never actually reach the end goal of complete understanding. At the end of it all, the reason these epistemological debates are both compelling and also multidimensional is precisely because there is no right or wrong way to think of this stuff. If there was a singular truth, as it were, on the subject of truth, the topic of epistemology would cease to exist. It would be a closed book, end of debate. 
For this reason, we ought to be wary of anyone who claims to have the answer. My personal epistemology. As you may have guessed, I am a skeptic at heart. Skepticism questions the very possibility of knowledge and the justification of beliefs. It challenges the notion that we can have justified true beliefs about the external world. There are various degrees of skepticism, with the most radical skeptics believing we can know nothing at all, and many theories have emerged from this skepticism, including Hoffman's interface theory. We've assumed that there's uh, a pretty tight relationship between our perceptions and reality. If I look up and see the moon, then there is something that uh, exists in space and time that uh, matches um, what I perceive. And all I'm saying is that if you take evolution by natural selection seriously, then that is precluded. That Our perceptions are there. They're there to guide adaptive behavior, full stop. They're not there to show you the truth. In fact, the way I think about it is they're there to hide the truth because the truth is too complicated. However, skepticism, like postmodernism, has a devil at its core, and that devil is nihilism. You see, when you believe in nothing, and you take that belief quite literally, it can be rather detrimental to one's own mental well-being. René Descartes, I think, therefore I am, his conclusion that the only thing we can be sure exists is ourselves, or rather, our thoughts, is the perfect example of a sort of deep thought process that can lead to a sense of futility about life and about one's own existence. In the same way that it may just be strategically more beneficial to you as a living organism to be optimistic about things rather than pessimistic, no matter what the actual truth of the scenario is. We are all susceptible to both negative and positive thoughts and the effect they can have to our mental well-being, and Hoffman's so-called interface theory implies the same thing, which is that we may have just evolved to perceive the world in such a way that we can understand it as a sort of protection mechanism against the much more complex underlying structures. It may be impossible for us to ever perceive the truth, like trying to work out the underlying technologies that make a computer work, but only having perceptual access to the pixels or icons on the screen. And for all of these reasons, and for the purposes of both my research and my living a happy life, I'll take the bus straight through that shady part of town we call nihilism and hop off at pragmatism. Please and thank you. Pragmatism. Pragmatists are aware of the arguments for and against an objective reality, but ask the question, does it really matter? Pragmatists don't mean this in a flippant sense, but rather the pragmatist chooses to allow these big philosophical debates to settle to one side in pursuit of pragmatic solutions to problems that help people in the real world. At least, the world we generally accept as the real one. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. And so now we come on to research methodologies. These are ways of approaching research based on one's underlying philosophical and, you guessed it, epistemological viewpoints. Or in other words, methodology is the analysis of the principles of methods, rules and postulates employed by a discipline. Research methodologies can be thought of as sitting at various positions on the spectrum between quantitative and qualitative, and although many have questioned this dichotomy, it remains a good starting point for understanding the underlying approaches and expectations of various research methods. The quantitative looks to put values on data. It wants data to be countable, measurable and numerical. Data is gathered by measuring and counting and then often analysed using statistics. The quantitative is thought of as fixed, universal and factual. Meaning in quantitative methods is derived from statistical analysis. Qualitative, on the other hand, is more descriptive, relating to words and language. Data is often gathered through methods such as observations and interviews, and then analysed by grouping data into meaningful themes and categories. Whilst quantitative seeks to tell us how many, how much or how often, qualitative seeks to describe the why or how behind certain behaviours and phenomena. Although it may seem that quantitative and qualitative are two ends of a dichotomy, it is probably more realistic to view them as part of a continuum, and this is where mixed methods research comes in. That is, research which uses a mixture of both qualitative and quantitative to come to conclusions. This methodology enables researchers to utilise the strengths of both methodological frameworks. Mind you, in a digital and deterministic universe, even the qualitative becomes quantifiable. And this is why the question, what is the smallest constituent part of physical matter, is such an important one. 
You see, the digital is made up of definitive yeses and noes. In computer language, these are ones and zeros, as in binary code, the method all modern computers use to process and produce data. If the universe is digital, everything is measurable. Even your emotions, which it would be argued are really just the social extrapolations of the underlying chemical conditions in your brain. In the digital, every particle of every atom in an entire system, i.e. the universe, has the potential to be measured and therefore for its future to be precisely predicted. The question at the heart of all of this is just how far can we push it? How far can the seemingly analogue be divided into smaller chunks? This links back to my question about smaller and smaller constituent parts of an atom. At the lowest point of the chain, is it all just a one or a zero? Coming back to research methodologies for a moment, linking epistemological perspectives to these are theoretical perspectives. Because we don't have the answer to these questions, I see flaws in both the quantitative and the qualitative. The quantitative believes we can ultimately draw meaning from data, that at the end of it all the data tells the story. The qualitative believes that life is more complex than that, that data could be misleading and that our best bet is to describe things. Yet the flaw here is that it is very difficult to ever come to any firm conclusions and therefore create real knowledge. The most hardcore versions of each of these camps despises the other for these inherent flaws, and whilst I myself lean toward the latter, the ambiguity of the qualitative doesn't always sit well with me either. Sometimes it's hard to see what the point of it all is, when ultimately, the researcher, their epistemological stance, their subjects, and their skewed perspectives, the topic, the methodology, the methods, the data, and the analysis of the data are all prone to subjectivity. In this sense, the researcher themselves becomes an interesting object of psychological and social investigation, probably over and above the research they've conducted. My research project. Impact through research dissemination. How can UK universities make best use of the media to maximise societal impact? My research is based on how UK universities could and arguably should utilise the media in more effective ways in order to share academic research more widely and thus achieve greater societal impact. This project idea arose from anecdotal conversations I've had with many of my academic colleagues who say that text-based journal articles don't always get the traction they require in order to have real impact. The solution to this problem of dissemination could come in many forms, but one potential solution might be podcasting, which has, in recent years, grown to become a hugely popular form of media. A podcast I produce, known as An Idiot's Guide to Academic Research, is a sort of testing bed for this idea, but I remain open-minded as to what the actual solution could be. Mixed Methods Methodologies With my research project in mind, I can now narrow down my provisional methodology. It would seem to me, just as I was forced with my epistemological stance, that I necessarily need to come to a compromise here. Yes, I believe that there is subjectivity in all we do, and even when we attempt to quantify we don't completely succeed, but I think that I also believe that at the very foundations of the universe there is something quantifiable. What else could it be? Isn't empirical science futile if there isn't? And so, the only way left for me to rationalise all of this is with some form of mixed methods approach. Beyond this, and under the banner of mixed methods research, there are a number of methodologies one can employ. This list is non-extensive, but gives a good range of ideas. Of these options, the four on the left are the ones that stand out to me as being more appropriate for my particular research project. So let's dive into each of them to see which of these might be most appropriate. Action research has a pragmatic approach at its heart in that it seeks to solve real-world problems. In order to do so, the action researcher produces potential solutions, analyzes how those solutions work in the real world, and then iterates from there in a potentially endless loop. Action research tends to be a popular choice in education-based research, as actions taken can be delivered and iterated upon within classroom sessions, thus enabling an efficient iterative loop. Design-based research is similar to action-based research in that it puts at its core the principle of producing a solution, testing it, and iterating. However, as far as I can tell, design-based is primarily focused on producing a usable product and or service as opposed to the more broad term used in action research of producing a solution. 
Action research and design-based research are closely linked with practice-led research, which can be thought of as a sort of subset of practice-based research. There are a number of ways to divide practice-based research, but a useful way of thinking about the distinctions within the category are whether it is research for practice, of practice, within practice, or through practice. I suppose my project, although hard to say for sure at the moment, would predominantly fall into the latter, as I will likely be experimenting with various media outputs to analyse their respective effectivenesses. Discourse analysis does what it says on the tin. Researchers analyse wider discourse of a particular topic as discussed within a particular context. This method may be useful to me in understanding what the general public's view of academia and academic research is, and so I may well incorporate some of this methodology into my study. Each of the conclusions I have come to whilst researching for this video essay are slowly branching down, or up, to a more and more specific destination. Imagine, for a moment, that my epistemological stance are the roots of one tree in a whole orchard of trees, the other tree's roots being other epistemologies. These roots of mine lead up to the trunk, a particular set of theoretical perspectives that are bound to my roots. The trunk emerges from the roots. The roots necessitate the trunk. This trunk then leads to a handful of thick branches, my methodologies. Beyond this, the smaller twigs will most likely be the specific methods I utilise in my research and the leaves which grow from the twigs, the data I acquire. Hopefully, with any luck, one day my tree will produce some tasty fruit in the form of conclusions from the data I gather. Funnily enough, and in very meta fashion, the objective of my research project is for many people to taste not only the fruit from my branches, but from all the trees in the orchard of academic research, to unlock the gate of the orchard and welcome everyone inside. Thank you. Good night.